Hello. So you're you're mere you're mere blocks from me, basically, maybe a mile or two. You're very close now. Like over there, somewhere. Somewhere over there. And you guys are, are new in the house, though, right? Down drifting down to my me in the flats here. And but you how long ago did you guys move in? Because you hadn't moved in as of Thanksgiving. Right before, right before Christmas. Right before Christmas. And so yeah. is everything going smooth sailing over there? Yeah, it's, it's, it, we, I mean, you know, all the boxes came back in. Uh, it, it's amazing because, you know, we added another room and a bigger, made the kitchen bigger and I put a, another big bedroom. And all these boxes came back and I'm like, where did we put all this stuff? You know, I mean, it's just like, got an extra, ma- and one extra massive closet and, and, uh, and I had to throw out like so much stuff, you know. I just uh, are you are you guys unpacked because that you haven't been there very long uh yeah i mean we're doing we, we, it's doing it's going it's going pretty well well i'm so glad <laughs> so, my, my office is was the last box chaos and and so now we're down the the boxes so it's, it's opening stuff up and just putting away we got we got mainly it's the 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 pictures on the walls stuff that we got to do. Um, well, yeah, that that's that's finishing touches. You're doing you're 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 looking pretty organized behind you back there. Well, this is my this never got touched. This is my studio. This is this is this, this is, is this is sacrosanct. This you know, I can tell you. See you see this <laughs> you see this this wall here. The, the wall look. of drums. Yes, I see the wall of drums. It goes up pretty high. It used to go to here, right? Okay. Yeah. And so I extended it. Wait, we can't see the top of it. I think there's more. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I extended it from from here to here, right? Yeah. There's another another three or four drums. No, three. I'd say three. Three drums on each row down that I can get on there all the way down to the bottom. Wow. And I've still got a pile of drums sitting over there that I can't fit on there. And then... How did I just? I I thought I made enough space to put everything up off the floor. Well, you're gonna have to. Do you have another wall that you can build some more shelves? Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe. Yeah, kind of. And so, do you have privacy so that you can actually play down that you can play in your garage? Do I have what? Do you have privacy? Like, can you play full out? Oh. I had uh, yeah, I had a I had a whole studio built in here. That I, I can I can. There's people that live in the next garage over there. They got one of those. What they got ADU units. Yeah. This far, this far away. Wait, wait. What's ADU? Where they they have, you have a little you make a house out of a garage or you make a oh 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 yes 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 living space. Um, Bet Sussman says hello. Ah, Bet Sussman. <laughs> How is Bet? How are you, Bet? The birthday the other day. I wish happy birthday on a Facebook page. Look how you remembered she that. Never, she never calls me or never writes to me anymore. So, <laughs> she got so I've known Bet since the '80s, and I first, I actually became. You used to come into my clubs and jams, Spodiotis, the China Club, the Rock and Roll Cafe, Woody's, all these clubs that I used to do these jams at. You would come in, but I never could get near you because you, you literally always were surrounded by people that just wanted a piece of you. <laughs> Because you were already a rock star in the in the eighties, you were already the deal. So I never, I never looked at myself that way. I know you didn't, but everybody else did. It was like Ferroni's here, Ferroni's. It was like the buzz would go through the club that it was very exciting. That um... is he drunk? <laughs> <laughs> so all right, so let's talk about that because we were just talking before we went live that uh, you, we both have a sober birthday coming up in in April. So. What we didn't talk about this last time. Did you have a bottom, Steve? What what made you get sober? Because now you're going on. You're going to be thirty. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm going to, uh, next year, uh, right now, in twenty nine. In my in, in my group, we're not allowed to say that. You know, no, no, I'm going to be thirty. You see, I have twenty. I, I totally agree with that. Some yes, I totally agree with that. I, I have twenty nine years. So I, I just, only said it because a friend of mine uh, has a coin for you that has a big three zero on it. That's why I was thinking about that. But anyway, yes, twenty nine. Well, I I, 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 you know, I had to correct somebody the other day. They said, "Wow, twenty nine Christmases," and I'm like, "No, it's been thirty Christmases because That's I had right. 
I, I was I was uh, I think like six or seven months over when I did my first Christmas and my first New Year's. And so, did you have a bottom? Well, what was your bottom like? Why did you get sober, Steve? It was horrible. <laughs> I tell you what was horrible. I had all these problems. Kids. I had kids all over the place. And child. how many? How many kids? You have a lot of kids. How many kids? How many kids do you have? Four children. How many? And, uh, four of them. Four of them. Yeah, and and I had two with one of my wives. I had four ex wives, and I had two children with one of my wives, and then I had two children from extramarital. Well, not even extra. Well, one was extramarital affair. One was just a, an affair. Uh, 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 outside of that, and 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 it was a, an avalanche of problems for me because you know it was it was I just didn't know what to do. I was I used to be able to get drunk and forget about it. That, yeah, that was that was. What were I, you were you an irresponsible father before you got sober? No, I don't say I don't think I was an irresponsible father, but I I I I I, I was. Uh, Irresponsibly throwing my seed around. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, irresponsible father, no. Yes. Okay. Uh, irresponsible mate, yes. Yeah. Okay. But of course, I didn't look at it that way then. Right. Uh, uh, they got pregnant. I had nothing to do with it. I was just having fun. <laughs> <laughs> they got pregnant. They how got pregnant. How could they do this to me? <laughs> Um, have there been any surprise? Did you know about all of them in real time? Were there any surprises no, later? I, mean, uh, I knew. Well, my 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 two children, I knew about them. Uh, uh, Jason, Jason, and Becky, the ones I. When I say my two, I mean the ones I raised. Right. Um, um, uh, I knew about them from the from the from the get go, and there was one in between them that I didn't find out about until nine years later. Oh boy and so i'm guessing that was one of those was that one of those ugly paternity things yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it, it it was uh it was it was it was it was it was horrible because oh. it, the, okay look you know it, you, you have a kid you pay child support that's that's kind of the way that i was brought up with it. right you know, if, if that's what you got to do, you got to do it. But what happened was, was that because of the people that I'd worked with, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I'd worked with well, I, uh, well, average white band, that was a pretty big band, but that sort of went, that sort of stopped. And that, that, that was pretty easy to explain where the money went from that. It was that the whole band got ripped off, basically. Is that true? I don't know that story. It was it was just one of those one of those one of those rip off stories of the, the band. Uh, uh, we lived pretty high on the hub, but but it was what a great band! I saw you guys. You what a you were great live. What a great it band! Wasn't like big massive money that I've seen flying around. It's like why did I can get that kind of money when I was in a big band? You know. So, so but uh, uh, that was how that worked out for us. Uh, uh, and then, uh, and then, but then afterwards was like you know Eric Clapton and uh, and uh, and um, uh, you know all the people that I'd recorded with. You know, well, yeah, you were playing with George Harrison. You were playing with ridiculous people. Around and, and all this stuff, and they, and and they they were insisting that I had like their money. I see. And they, no, uh, I'm a, I'm a hired, I'm a hired hand. But like when you were with Average White Band, you were getting full share, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, but full share of what? Though? That was that was a, that was a that was a that was a that was a whole different thing. You know, they gave us enough money to keep us happy, but there, there was never any big payday. It was never I like see. A big, never, never like a big massive check came in. Mm -hmm. and uh and and then there was all kinds of things so they they, they didn't pay taxes for us and all, oh. all of a sudden I got, I got the irs knocking on my door saying i'm criminal evasion of taxes and i'm like what i've been paying taxes what are you talking about and then uh, you know there the, the, was a, an effort to make me run from that you know and and uh and I, I wasn't about to run. I wasn't going to run for that. I'm done. I got 
I, I went and saw, they sent me to an, an, an attorney that wanted to charge me an enormous amount of money uh, to, to, to get you off. That's what he said, you know, and I didn't have that kind of money. I didn't have that money. You know, like, what are you talking about? I don't have that kind of money. You know? and, and he's like, I said, you know what, I'm just going to go down and see the IRS. And he said, if you do that, you're going to go to jail. You know? And uh, and I said, well, that's you know, that's what it's going to be. That's what I'm going to have to do. And I went down and just gave everything. I gave everything I had to the IRS, and they uh, uh, they investigated it, and they they said, okay, well, you know, you've been forthright with us. Uh, you file file your taxes to the best of your abilities, and, and we if we find anything down the road, we won't we won't say that it's criminal, and um, and that's what I did. Filed everything I honestly is honestly, and basically that was it done. So you didn't get money from that. You were a hired gun when you were playing with Clapton, when you were playing with George Harrison, when you were playing was, with all of these people. Duran Duran, you were a hired hand also, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, how, how did how did you get that gig? How did how did how did you happen into Duran Duran? It doesn't seem like a likely place to find you. Well, I was. I was in New York and I was, I was, I think I was doing like Saturday Night Live and, 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 and doing some um, uh, uh, sessions around town. And just uh -huh. playing with people. And, uh, and my drum tech, a guy named Artie Smith. I don't know, did you ever meet Artie? No, uh, I don't think so. The character used to do a lot of, 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 um, of, of uh, cartage for people around town. And, and he, was doing some stuff with uh, John Taylor. With, um, I happen to have met John Taylor in a place that we go recently. He's a lovely and, man. And, and uh, uh, he was, John was talking about, you know, I think Artie was asking him, you know, what, what are you guys doing with Duran? Because they mm -hmm. sort of split up at that point and they did, you know, a couple of different bands. And and he said, well, I think you're getting back together. I don't know, you know, don't know who to get for a drummer. We have to look like looking for a drummer. And Artie said, well, you know, Steve, why don't you call Steve? Steve Froney. He's doing a lot of stuff right now. He's doing a lot of work around here. So I got this phone call from John Taylor. I said, Artie, I think Artie called me and said that he'd given my number to John Taylor. And then uh, John called me up and said, you want to come and, you know, see if you can work with us a little bit. And they flew me over to London. We started working on, on material, and then uh, and then Simon showed up, and then out of that came um, uh, um, Notorious. So, what was that like? I mean, they were so huge then, and they were a very different kind of music than you were used to playing. Than you had been oh, famous yeah. for playing. You know, they, they, uh, I thought it was it was kind of interesting that you know they had. Because they've worked a lot with Bernard Edwards and 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 uh, and Nile uh, Rogers, they yeah. uh, uh, you know they they were they were very young when they started. Uh, you know, it was the uh, I, I can't even say luck. They they had a, they had a sense of mm -hmm. what they wanted. Mm -hmm. They they really had a. Uh, I can't say that they just sort of went in there and had blind luck. You know, they 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 knew about style and 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 they they knew that they had a, a brand before we even talked about brands that they could sell and and then the video the whole video world was opening up and they and they had these huge hits with video i mean they came out of straight out of school and became the biggest band in the world and uh and and uh, but uh, 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 was MTV was was that? Do you think they had that massive success? MTV had to be a big help to them. MTV was a big was a big factor in Duran Duran, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they they knew how to milk that, and they knew how to how to get. I mean, they had the guys with looks, you know. John's particularly handsome man, and uh, and uh, and Nick Nick has got a look about him. You know, he had this sort of artsy art, artsy sort of look, artsy thing about him, and. And Simon, of course, you know, he's a good looking guy, dating a supermodel and, uh, 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 well, married to a supermodel now, but, but, but uh, I mean, they, they had, they, they really had a, 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 a and then, uh, you know, uh, Roger Taylor with the drummer, you know, was a handsome fella and, 
and uh, and uh, and Andy Taylor, the 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 guitarist, was the wild guy. You know, was the wild man in the band. And uh, and so they had this whole, I mean, I guess boy band thing before boy bands were a thing. You know, right? They were the first, yeah. absolutely. Uh, uh, young and uh, I mean, the Beatles were young when they when they did their thing too, but. This was on a on a much bigger level in a, in an established industry now. I mean, the Beatles sort of made their industry, uh, our industry, um, but um, there was a, a there was a, a, a they had a they had a thing about j- just the way that they would they would work at, at songs. You know, it was funny because I, I sat down. We sat down. I sat down with Nick and Simon, uh, Nick and um and John. And we sat down and we'd come up with these ideas of, uh, mm-hmm. of, of, of starts of a song, and just like, we, and we'd work on them a little bit, and and then and Simon, uh, Simon hadn't showed up yet, you know, and then we we'd been a couple of weeks into it and had a number of different ideas, mm-hmm. starts of what would be would eventually be a song. There was no mm-hmm. top melody line or anything to it, and Simon came in and listened to it. And uh, and and uh, it all sounded really just like a regular band until Simon changed a couple of a couple of chords to to make a more the place for for him to go and sing on on these songs and uh, and then we started to play them with these chords in them and then Simon opened his mouth and started singing and and there it was it sounded like Duran Duran yeah. So the the pieces just pop together. So and Steve, you've played, you've done so many different genres and so many different artists that are so variant. Yeah. Do you have a favorite thing to play? Is it where do you live? Like where, where do you live? Where is it when you go in there and you say I'm home? Is it everything? Is there? Is there because you've you've played with Clapton with with the Heartbreakers for years. Duran Duran, uh, uh, average white band. These are very different kinds of music, all of them. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think soul sort of soul sort of passes through everything. Everything has soul to it, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, uh, I started off playing soul music, Uh, and um, uh, and then. the last time we met, you were you had just gotten a call that day from Booker T. Jones. You were going to going to go play, and you were so excited because that I guess that's kind of where you one of the places you live, yeah. right? Really cool. Yeah, I, I did a record with him and and did a, did a few shows with him. That was that was something getting to play with him. He was, he's just an amazing musician. But you know, I mean, I, I think. Uh, you know, uh, kind of like we we're saying about Duran Duran is is that is that, that all these people have been valid for years. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I mean, well, it's been thirty years now. Duran Duran's been around. They're not unbelievable. They just did the the countdown show on New Year's. They're as relevant now as they ever were. And they still write new songs mm-hmm. and, and and perform new music. And uh, are not afraid to put it out and go out and play, and that's fantastic. Eric Clapton puts out new records, and uh, it's Petty Petty used to do new records all the time. Let me ask um, you about this because I know somebody that saw Clapton recently, and a huge Clapton fan forever, and just saw him on this most recent tour and felt that he had kind of that he wasn't into it at all, that he, maybe it was just that one performance, but that he had kind of phoned it in. Moments like that, I think. Uh, uh, you think it's a moment? You think he's still loving what he's doing? I think putting out talent like that is kind of, it's kind of hard to do. You know? mm-hmm. I, I think uh, uh, the only person that can sort of run that into the ground is yourself. And then, uh, um, uh, you know, he, he, He's he's a he's a phenomenal player. It, 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 it's a, a dare I say genius. I mean, he, yeah. he has yeah, he has a touch with the guitar, and he has a he has a voice, and he has a a, a, a way of playing stuff that, that that nobody else can do. I mean, he's just he's Eric Clapton. 
So I don't think I asked you this no, last time <laughs> either. How did, how did you start playing? How, how did that relationship begin? I, I, I got introduced to it. Phil Collins introduced him, me to him in, um, in London at Bob Geldof's Knighthood Park. Yeah. And I was there with Duran Duran at the uh, Hard Rock in London celebrating Bob's one of us getting the knighthood you know I had to, I got uh, to have tea with Sir Bob it's quite lovely yeah. actually <laughs> and uh, uh how so so you're playing with Duran Duran Phil Phil Collins at Sir Bob Gilhoff's place is introducing you to Eric Clapton all right this is all rock gods out the wazoo hey, he, came up, he said have you ever did you ever meet Eric Clapton and I said I met him I met him once ages ago with he came he came to an average white band show just just to say hello that was mm -hmm. it he said well come meet him again I said okay so I go over to his table and Eric's sitting there and we were sitting there and we just sat there and talked and small talk you know and just uh, 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 uh. and then I said well really nice hanging out with you I better get over to my guys you know it's not really nice hanging out with you and then a couple of weeks later I got this phone call you know do you want to go play with Eric Clapton I'm like well, I'd like that. Uh, yeah, I'd like to play with him. So how do you do that, Steve? How do you leave Duran Duran to go play with Clapton? How, how do you make that segue? Well, I didn't in the beginning. I mean, uh, I, I actually I actually spent about three weeks at home that, that, that year when, when I started working with Eric and Duran. I, I, I spent three weeks, three weeks at home and it was just, <laughs> I, I wanted to spend a bit more time in my house, you know. And so something had to stop, and uh, and uh, Duran had sort of stopped. Uh, uh, we we sort of run the, the whole uh, notorious thing. The contract was over. We finished with that, and uh, and and, uh, and Eric had been very very gracious in, in waiting for when I had time off in, in between Duran Duran commitments, and then he'd slot something in, and I go play with him somewhere. And then uh, as soon as that commitment stopped with Duran, then uh, you know. And I mean, I I I I I kept working on and off with Duran, uh, like studio stuff and everything with them. Uh, after that, but I was basically you know, more committed to to uh, Eric Clapton's band. And I was having a ball playing with that band. It's a great band. What a great uh, so I I. I... I can only imagine that playing well, with he, went, he didn't look like he wanted to retire with that band. I can tell you that right. Now. <laughs> I, I saw you. I saw you with Clapton too in '87 at the Brendan Byrne Arena, and oh, um, wow. I came with Phoebe Snow, and we got to have dinner. He was eating dinner. We got to sit with him before the show, and I was really shocked that he didn't invite her up to sing. But I don't think that's something he does. Did he do that kind of thing? I didn't get the feeling he does that kind the of thing. Person, the only person that ever came and sat in with us that I remember mm -hmm. was, uh, was um, um, oh, God. <laughs> 12 oh, seconds God. and I ain't waiting. It'll come. They go around in circles. They, they... Oh, um, it, Billy Preston. Billy Preston is the only guy. Yeah. Wow. He's, he came He came and sat in with us in in when we played in uh in in holland mm -hmm. and he broke the keys on alan clark's Hammond oh. organ. <laughs> oh god alan, look at this the keys were just snapped oh shit wow um <laughs> i guess he played hard huh yeah. um that had to be i can only imagine i talk about a genius it had, musically to be part of that for those years had to be extraordinary for you, I would imagine. It was wonderful. I mean, it was just, you know, it was funny. Uh, some years ago I was in Chicago and, and Eric Eric was uh, in the same hotel as us in uh, in the Ritz-Carlton. And uh, and I called him up and uh, and uh, we went and had breakfast together one morning and, uh, and we were sitting up in breakfast. And Eric looked at me and he said, do you remember when we played, when we played in Montreux? We did a, we played a Montreux festival once, um, and uh, and I said, yeah. And he said, he said, you know, he said, I saw a video of that the other day. And, uh, yeah, he said, he said, we were fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> and I, said, I said, you just realised that. <laughs> wow. You just you just you just realised that 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 band was on fire. 
Yeah. Now, if I recall, and I do recall, he had just gotten sober when I met him in 87. He was already sober then, right? So um, yeah. Uh, he had already written cocaine, I think. Oh, yeah. Unless, was, yeah. yeah. He, 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 had, he, had, he had a few minutes when he would. Ah, I see. Go back and forth. Yeah. So, so you were still drinking and using when you were playing with Clapton. Oh yeah. Uh, but was he, was he so was he part time still partying once in a while too in those days? Um, it, yeah, in the beginning he was, and then he wasn't, and then mm-hmm. he was, and then he I, was, and and, and uh, I, I remember uh, uh, the first inclination uh, that I had that uh, what he was doing was working was when uh, Connor died oh. and uh, I thought oh. I thought uh, I was the only person in town from the band when that happened uh, oh. and, um, Alexander Saraspi gave me a call she was uh, Russ Titman's assistant and said something's just happened I just heard it on the news and it's horrible and I don't want to talk about it you should get in touch with Eric and I'm like what the hell and I called up Eric and and uh, and he was he answered the phone and he was just and I said, I tell you what, don't move. I'm gonna come up. Oh, uh, uh, and I was just, don't talk to me about anything. I'm gonna come up there. And I went out and I opened the door and I'd seen it last time I saw him was about a week before. We just got off the road and 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 he it had aged him just it was like oh. it aged him just like overnight. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and then he, he just like he, he was very you know distraught, crying, and, oh. and and he pointed to a table and there was some toys that Connor played with in his hotel room, and I took them, put them in a refrigerator, and uh, and then we went just over, to get them out of sight. Then we went over to we went over to the to the to the uh, the, the building that Connor had fallen out of to the apartment. Oh. And uh, and uh, and it was, uh, and uh, and I got to 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 sit there and and, and try and uh, just to help. It was horrible. Oh, I I can't even. I always fathom. thought, uh, but I always thought, you know, when I, uh, I thought that if anybody deserved um, some sympathy, mm-hmm. let him have a drink for this, you know. Just let him have a let him have a man needs a drink for this. Uh, you know, this is, it was just tragic. Mm-hmm. I thought if anybody needed deserved a, a chance to have a drink at that point. And did he did he take that chance? He didn't. Wow. Wow. He didn't. And wow. Was, and I was uh, I was astonished that he came through that kind of pain. Wow. To come through that kind of pain like that. Yeah. You've gotten you've gotten you've gotten a call like that one time too many because you also got the call when Tom died, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, is that we? Uh, uh, I guess you know when I when when I when I saw how how Eric handled handled that uh, Connor passing, and I thought, well, you know, there is a way to do deal with this stuff without without drinking and mm-hmm. using oblivion there is a way to deal with that yeah and it took me years after that to get around to 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 getting sober okay so let's go back to that because we started to talk about it so okay so you weren't a good mate and you you were dropping seed around town and you but what but but what actually what was the thing what what was the day you said okay i'm done what 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 happened that day that you said okay i'm done this is my life this is the 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 day the day that (laughs) uh you know i'd stopped drinking oh no i hadn't stopped drinking uh, Mm. but drinking was not doing what it used to do I used to be able to say, how with this? I'm not going to deal with it. I'm going to go out, go to the China Club, get completely blasted, hang out, and uh, and, uh, and 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 I go do that. And I forget all about it you know, until the next day he come back and there it would be again. I'd have to deal with it again. Just go out and get blasted and forget about it. And then, 
But it, it ended up with me just in my apartment getting blasted, looking at the TV set at Home Shopping Club, thinking about all this mess that was going on with the courts and the lawyers and the, and what they were going to take from me or trying to take from mm. me, what they were saying about me that wasn't true. And, mm. and uh, how was I going to protect my kids? My kids didn't even know. My ex-wife didn't even know about all this stuff. And it, it Oh! Went, oh, no, no. Oh! No. Uh, 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 how was I going to protect all that? How was I going? And to this was in between your two, but this was nine years later. Yeah, yeah. And in between my two. And are you still married to the wife? No, no, no. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had, uh, you know, I'd had another couple of wives. I think. <laughs> No, one more. I'd had one more wife. One more wife and another kid. And another kid? Another kid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was at that point that I started digging. Uh, my my son is now 29 years old. He's going to be 30 next week. So Unbelievable. That was a... That was a wow. So right that, after that, you got yeah, sober. Right, so Another kid? <laughs> God. And you're and you're making hired gun money, right? You're making hired gun money. You're not. Yeah, I'm making good money. But Jesus, I can, I can, that's a lot of kids. It's a lot of kids. And and, and, and a lot of ex-wives. What they would, they, you know, it wasn't so much what I was making because, the you know, the law is the law. And, and, and that take they take a certain percentage and that belongs to each kid. Right. That's, that's done. Right. I'm going to shoot you right down. You're going to shoot uh, me right now. Um, uh, but the but the the problem the problem was was that that everybody thought that I was kind of like the secret billionaire or millionaire or million. I don't know they there was talk about that I had offshores, and I'm like, well, if I got one, could you find it for me? Because <laughs> I can use it. <laughs> yeah, <You know>, and. <laughs> And the expense of lawyers, and I had to fight it. I couldn't not fight it because if well, I wait, how can you fight it? You were legit. You didn't know you were the legit father. You well, didn't yeah. know. Yeah, I knew. It was, I mean, I had to go and do a test. I mean, you know, I, had to, I went down and did a test. Well, and, so what are you fighting? If if you are the father, what are you fighting? Well, I was fighting was what they said that I had. Oh, I see. You were fighting what your financial situation was. Yeah. I was, yeah. 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 I, they're saying. Okay, uh, okay, that'll be like uh, thirty thousand dollars a month, right? Which is, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, and I'm like, I don't have that kind of money. Why do you think I got that kind? <laughs> wow, well, you got this, and you got that, and you got that. No, I don't. And I and I and I, oh. and, I and I take my tax returns, and I take all my stuff, and I give it to them, and they say, "Well, you got stuff hidden in offshores." And I'm like, No, I don't have anything. <laughs> you know, if I did. I'd pay you and to leave to get out. I give you everything I had to go away. Yeah, no. but uh, and so you're still drinking through this. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, until until it stopped having the desired effect of being able to forget about my problems, and uh, and, and I just end up sitting there looking at the TV set. Like, what the hell? Do, do, what what am I going to do? And, and so uh, what was the day? What was the thing? What was that minute that you made that decision? I came out here uh, and uh, and um, and I was doing a, a late night show with Brian Ferry. Aww. And, and uh, Nathan, my friend Nathan East, who played, also played with Eric Clapton, was, uh, I was at his house. And I was sitting in his kitchen and I had some drugs and I had some a bottle of vodka because it was it was a week after my birthday and somebody had given me presents <laughs> nice presents and, uh, and, um, <laughs> and nathan was cleaning his kitchen and i was sitting in his kitchen table and i'm sitting there and 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 and, and you know snorting and drinking and looking at nathan cleaning his house and i said you know nathan I don't even know what I'm doing this way. I'm not even going out anywhere to hang out tonight. You know, I said, I've been doing this for a while and I'm fed up with it. So, you know, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I'm going to cut all this stuff out. I'm going to stop. I don't want to do this anymore. And Nathan said, great, Steve. Fantastic. 
swear off. Let's swear off now. Come on. We we'll swear off. And I'm like, whoa, slow down. <laughs> I'm going to finish this first. <laughs> Yeah, he was de- overly <laughs> enthusiastic about it. <laughs> and that's what I did. And so I, 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 I finished, well, everything except there, there was, you know, I know there was a bottle of Stolich Naya and there was a green piece of wool tied around the top with the label, with the label with the happy birthday thing had been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and there was this much poker left in the bottom of the bowl. And it stayed there for years because I lived in that house. After wow. That. Still there. Wow. And so did you go to a meeting? Did you just do it on your own? How ha- ha- had you do it? I just, I, I just went back home. I didn't you know. But I, 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 <laughs> I'm stopping. Okay, I'm fed up with it. I'm not going to drink anymore. Get back no, home. no, no, no withdrawal, no DTs, no none of that. Not, that Not at that point. And I didn't think that there was going to be any. I, you know, I wouldn't like them. Right. <laughs> Those losers. I, me either. Uh, yeah. So I go, but I go, I, I call my, my friend calls me up and says, uh, I get back home and he says, uh, Steve, he said, uh, hey, I own a barbecue at my house. My friend Glenn. I own a barbecue at my house. Do I come over? Um, you know, Glenn, uh, I've uh, I've stopped. Uh, I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not drinking. I'm not doing any drugs anymore. He said, "It's a barbecue." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "I know, but I want you to know, I'm not drinking. I'm not doing any drugs anymore." Great, it's a barbecue. I'm cooking. Come on over. So I said, "All right." So I go over there, and uh, and uh, 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 and I'm sitting in the in his backyard and he's cooking and people are coming in and I'm drinking water a Coca-Cola. Hey, how are you doing? Nobody nobody said anything. Nobody nobody really cared, right? That I wasn't drinking. Then this beautiful girl walks in and sits there. <laughs> right? And and uh, I start talking to this girl and uh, and uh, things are going really well. You know, so well, so well that I say to her, Listen, uh, you want to go down to the Merck Bar? You remember the Merck Bar on Mercer Street? No. Mercer Street in Soho, this little bar. I don't think I knew that bar. Mm -hmm. I said, you want to go down to the Merck Bar? She said, oh, yeah, great. So we go down to the Merck Bar. And we get down there and, you know, still Coca-Cola, water, and we're talking. Everything's Everything's going really well. And I say to this girl, listen, how come I've never met you before? See where this is going. Go ahead. He says, I've met you three times before. (laughs) (laughs) I came to your house with your friend Glenn there. I sat next to you at a dinner party. And I came with everybody to one of the concerts that you did with Clapton and Madison, New Jersey or somewhere. Oh, God. Wow. But were you a blackout drunk? Well, I think that I was a focused drunk (laughs) because I think no matter how beautiful anybody was that was around me, I was focused on getting what I wanted and I wanted some booze and to get wasted. That was what I wanted first. That was the first thing I wanted. And and that uh, that was the start of a four and a half year relationship. Oh, wow. No children there? No, 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 no. None that you know actually, of. Huh? Actually, I, I'm godfather to a her child. Oh, how lovely! Oh, that's so, lovely. So, uh, uh, what happened was that uh, you know, I mean, it, 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 as I say, this it was it wasn't just a like a, a quick thing. This was something. It was a, a, a relationship that had started that day. And uh, uh, and uh, and then uh, about you know three or four days later, I'm in my house sleeping, and and uh, and I have a I have a dream, and the dream is is I'm in a black blackout, and in 
in out of the blackness of this room comes a spoon with a great big pile of cocaine on it and it comes it f- sort of floats in it's disembodied and it stops on my on my face you know and i say into the darkness i don't do this anymore it's, wow it doesn't move, doesn't move. So, okay hold my breath and i guess in my sleep i held my breath you know and it wasn't moving. It wouldn't go away. And finally, I, I had to take a breath and I sat up in bed and I was covered in sweat and I was terrified and my heart was pounding trying to get out of my chest and and uh, uh, and I couldn't tell if I'd done it or not. Wow. And and, I, and I'm sitting there in, in the darkness of my room just sweating and heart beating and, and I was like, what the hell was that? That was that was a weird that was a weird dream, and uh, 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 and I thought well, that's strange, and that started like three weeks of that every night. And wow, I was, wow! I was detoxing, didn't tell anybody about it. I mean, I go out to dinner with this girl, and uh, and we never, I never told her anything about that, and she she'd already told me she'd already told me that. The first night that we were out, you know, after I, after I said that I didn't remember, she said, "Well, you know what? If you would if you were drinking, like you were before, we wouldn't be out on this date now." Mm. Right. So that was kind of a, something that, uh, but I won't go about to let her know that there was this problem, and uh, and uh, but uh, it was it was a scary thing every night, and uh, by the time. I- I finished. I was a mess. But by the time, but by the time uh, I was in this fight and I was losing it, let's put it that way. Uh, my willpower was, uh, I knew what would stop it. All I had to do was have a drink. But I'm a stubborn man. And, uh, 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 but I was losing. I was going to lose it. Were you, um, were you going to meetings then or did you, were you doing it on your own? Some uh, that's when that's when do you did you ever meet a guy named Stephen Bruton? You well, asked me that last time. No, I never met him. Mm-mm. Stephen Bruton was a fantastic singer, songwriter guy. Uh, he, we worked together with Christine McVie. Mm-hmm. We used to Aww. cry together. He put us the Steve Twins. And uh, and uh, he was a Texan school, tall, skinny, good looking Texan guy, cowboy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I am what I am. They called us the twins, the Steve twins. <laughs> and he was a great guy. And uh, and he stopped drinking about four years before. Mm-hmm. And he used to come to New York and he would hang out with me. And he said, you know, I'm not drinking or anything anymore. I'm not doing any of that anymore. I said, okay, cool. And we just hang out with me. I would. He never said anything to me about anything. Mm-hmm. But, but we, we'd hang out and it, and it was always good to see him. He, he never said anything to me about anything. Yeah, you know? and uh, and then he, uh, uh, he. What is it called? Not pro- it, I can't even think of it. I hear it every day. Not promotion. It's um attraction, not promotion. Thank you. Uh, and he 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 would come and hang out with me, and uh, he's still my friend. And every once in a while, he called me. He called me over. Hey, how are you doing? And I said, Oh man, I said uh, everything's fucked. And he said, What do you mean? And I said. I'd given up everything. What do you mean you've given up everything? No more booze, no more drugs. You know, well, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> it's fucked. <laughs> ah, it's awful. I can't sleep. I'm going to all this. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, you were uh, talking to him the- while you were having these crazy dreams? This happened? Yeah, yeah. this is like, a, this, uh, he called me up. He just called me up in the middle of this thing. He called me up just to see how I was. And I told him everything. And at that point, he said to me, "Have you tried going to an AA meeting?" And I and I am knee jerk reaction. Well, I don't want to go down there. You know, no, mm, oh, I ain't I ain't that bad. <laughs> it was a mess, right? <laughs> but but uh, 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 I, yeah. and he said, "Stay where you are, and I'll call you right back." And he and he booked the flight. And he wasn't a rich guy or anything. You know? See, wow! I jumped on a plane in in uh, in uh, in Austin. Wow! And he there that evening, 
came to my house. It was good to see him. I hung out at my house, and he said, "Yeah, tomorrow I'll get us a, a, a. I'll take you to a meeting tomorrow." Yeah, yeah, sure, fine. And we just talked about the, all what we usually talked about. Uh, you know, uh, 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 both our ex-wives were friends, and we were friends. We used to hang out together as a foursome, you know, and and um, and uh, uh, um, you know, we talked about that music and you know, life in general, how good things were going. And uh, and then the next day he got up and uh, and he looked up a meeting and he said, look, there's a meeting right around the corner on on uh, Houston Street uh, at 1230. Let's go there. And and the only reason that I went was out of the goodness of my heart, because he'd come all the way from Texas. He'd come all the way from Texas to take me to this dang meeting. I mean, the least thing I could do was just show up. To that. And so I followed him over and we went to Midnight Madness. Well, I came to find out that it was, I didn't know it was Midnight Madness. And, and uh, we went up there and for the, for the, for the 1230 uh, uh, um, meeting. And, uh, and I sat in there and listened to a guy talking. And I felt better. It was that simple. I hadn't felt that good in weeks, sitting in there listening to this guy talk. And then people gave me all this like, attention, you know, newcomer attention, gave me these books and pamphlets and a copy of Living Sober uh, and, uh, and uh, meeting directory. And uh, then Steve just went back to Texas and got left me there on my own with my stuff, you know. And of course, after just through the day, everything wore off again, you know, the anxiety. Of the... So I got that meeting book out and I looked, and I'm going to go. And I found this meeting um, called Fireside, which is mm -hmm. in the YMCA, uh, Midtown. Uh, it's handy for the studios. And I went up there and I walked in there and uh, just to, to get get a get a fix of feeling good again. And sure enough, that's what happened. You know? And that was the start of me. So I mean, he was kind of your Eskimo right there, even though you were already not drinking. That really, he was your Eskimo that really kind of saved your ass there. He put himself, he was my Eskimo. He put himself out um, and came to try and help another guy that was in trouble, even if he didn't want to be helped. And I didn't want to be helped. You know, I didn't know the way he wanted to help me. That wasn't what I thought was going to help me. You know, and, and I fought, I fought everything for years. I mean, I just went, I, for years, I just went to meetings because I, to get my fix of feel, my feel good meeting, you know. Go in there and have a laugh, and listen to some war stories, and know that they today they don't drink. That was basically it. I don't want to do steps. I want to get a sponsor. I didn't want to do any of that stuff. I didn't even want to go regular basis to a meeting. I did my first ninety meetings in ninety days because I heard about it and I did right. That. And then I got pissed off at somebody and stopped going completely. <laughs> then I walked in late. I did had a session that ran over, mm -hmm. and and and. And I and I and I and I finished the finished the session and and I ran up to the to the Y and I ran into the Y and I opened the door and there was this woman sitting there and she she looked at me and she went screw you <laughs> who the hell are you <laughs> screw that bitch <laughs> that's it and it, and it, immediately that's it. Not going to AA anymore. Not going to go there anymore. Screw that. Not going to do that. I stayed away. Probably a good nine, ten months. I stayed away. I, I stayed in contact with the people that I like, but I didn't. Yeah, you know, didn't. I I'd go to a meeting if I, if when crises hit. Mm. So and you. So you didn't have a sponsor through this time. Are, are you praying? Are you no. meditating? You're not working the steps. You're praying, you're meditating. No, you're not doing any of that stuff right now. Praying. Yes. Mm -hmm. I would say, I would say one of the things that this guy that followed me around, he missed to ask me questions. So I don't forget his name. He said, he, he, he said to me, he asked me about what my thoughts on God. And I said, well, I said, I believe him. Oh, I don't like him. You know, when, <laughs> when I come face to face with God, I'm gonna kick his ass. <laughs> he, runs, he runs everything very, very badly, and I can show him exactly how things need to be run. I was, I was deadly serious about that too. And he said, "Well, you do believe in God?" He said, "I said, okay, 
He said, when you go to bed at night, can you put something like your wallet or something underneath the bed? You know, just put it under the bed. You know? And when you're down there, say, thank you, God, for giving me supper today. And then when you get up in the morning, you've got to retrieve it. When you're down there, say, please, God, keep me sober today. And I thought, you know what? I could at least do that. I can do that. So I did that. And then, and then it was the end of my, my, my uh, 90 days, my mm -hmm. meetings in 90 days. I had a spiritual awakening of sorts. The, uh, I used to go to a meeting and I would say, my name's Stephen, I think I might be an alcoholic. I didn't want to say I was an alcoholic. And I was, and I was in my 90 days sober. Uh, this girl that I met, she had to go to New Mexico and put down a horse. And she asked me to say a prayer. And I said, well, you know, I was telling her, I don't, I, you know, she, didn't and she knew, I told her about all this stuff, about me being an alcoholic. I've got a problem with uh, praying. I don't know how to pray, who to pray to, what to do. And she said, well, I'll just... She said, you smoke cigars. Why don't you just take some tobacco and to scatter it to the four points of the compass? Like Native Americans do that. I said, okay. I went up to Central Park, broke up. I had two cigars, broke one up, scattered one to the, to the north, take care of her and her horse to the east, take care of my mum over there to the south, take care of those people in the AA meeting that I go to, and to the west, take care of me. How's about that? And I lit up, got my second cigar, fired it up, and I'm sitting up there at the cutoff where the, you know, where those big boulders are at the cutoff going through Central mm -hmm. Park. And I'm sitting on top of one of those things, and kids are playing baseball down there in this baseball field. And I'm sitting up this smoking cigar, beautiful day. And I looked up at the sun and I burst into tears, like racking sobs, like from just crying i mean from from deep down inside and i was like what the what the hell is this and i remember saying that's it there's nothing wrong i'm why am i crying like this there's no reason for me to be doing this i give up i fucking give up i give up i give up i'm done i give up and uh, I, I went and saw my therapist a therapist on central park west ran over there and he he, he had a customer and he said well, let me finish with the customer and i see you and i sat there and and then i went in and saw him and i start telling him what happened when i start telling him what happened i start crying again he's racking sobs again start happening and he's like you know you your feelings are connecting up you you, you you haven't had a drink in a while now and your, your feelings are connecting up just let that happen you'll be okay if you're gonna harm yourself call me but just go home and you'll be fine and I go home and I'm in the apartment, I'm walking around the apartment and I'm all right one minute, next minute I'm crying. <laughs> just, yeah, what the hell was it? I, and, I, and I really just, I just gave up. I just, just gave the whole thing up. And uh, uh, David Boyd called me from the China Club. And he said, hey, Steve, you coming to the China Club and, uh, tonight? And I said, I don't know, man, there's some weird stuff going on around here. And he said, Oh, come on, it's, a, it's the anniversary, you know, it's going to be a party tonight and everybody, all the people are going to be there. And I didn't have to worry about going to China Club because all the barmen were AA. <laughs> so, so they wouldn't let me drink when they found out that I, I work stopped. there. Yep. Yep. They were, they were all with me, right? They, mm -hmm. they, they were, all, they were all, 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 all on my side. Uh-huh. Jack, bartender Jack. Remember Jack? Jack was an AA, but, the, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 oh, Christ, um, I don't forget the names now. I, uh, it's so, okay. I, I, It'll I, come I, to you. Like ginger hair and glasses, and the, the other guy was an actor. I, 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 I'm still in touch with both of them. I forget. I just me and names pop out of my. But anyway, I go up. Uh, I, I, uh, he says, "Come up tonight, and if anything goes wrong, we put you in the back office, and you'll be on your own. You'll be fine." And I said, "Okay." So I go up. I go up to the China Club. Get up there, and we're hanging out. It's all these people I hadn't seen before. Oh, I hadn't seen him in a while. And this guy came up. I hadn't seen him in a long time. Hey, Steve, how you doing? Shakes my hand and palms an eight ball of cocaine into my hand. <laughs> I'm sitting there looking at this eight ball of cocaine. And I say to the guy, I, 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 don't, I don't do this anymore. And he said, knock yourself out. He said, knock yourself out. And I, <laughs> I said, I, I, I don't do this anymore. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. And he took it away. So no, it's okay. Yeah. But 
it wasn't the fact that I'd been able to say no to it that impressed me. What impressed me was I managed to say no to it and I didn't feel like a pussy. I like that. No, you you I felt strong. Feel, you felt good. You feel, felt. I didn't feel less than a man because I couldn't handle it. I didn't care what anybody thought. I just didn't want it. I love that. And how I, so? How long had you been sober at that point? Ninety days. Ninety days. And there always, I believe, there is a turning point at ninety days. Things do shift. Well, and 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 I and I and I and I really believe that that what happened that day was that. God was walking through Central Park and he saw me sitting there and I've been doing a bit of praying. He thought, oh, yeah, he needs a convincer. Bang. (laughs) He laid a a convincer on me. I I didn't even know what it was for or what that was about. There was no reason for me. But I just had enough of it. And from that day on, I I never had a problem saying that that I was alcoholic. And you've been you've been of service to a lot of people since then. And you you're you're a dedicated uh program person i i know you were getting you you do a very early morning i don't know if you still do but you were doing a very early morning meeting every day the last time we spoke every day <laughs> yeah wow yeah, yeah. I, I see my guys i got i got I, I i need to do it for me and i need to do it for the people that i help because if they're gonna if they want what i have then i gotta do something so i do that and uh, uh, my, my, uh I, I i tipping my bottle to uh to bill um yeah uh, 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 I was going to. I was just going to say that that um, um, uh, my sponsor passed away, and um, and uh, within two days of, of him passing away, I I had a new sponsor, and I've been working the steps again. Well, it's just this afternoon, I was still working on step one, uh, doing a lot of reading, kind of lots of. It's a, it's a bit a little bit different now because I'm a sponsor myself, and he's a very experienced sponsor. He, 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 he's an amazing speaker, and uh, and um, and so we we go, I'm reading I'm reading chapter by chapter, and, and it's funny. It just amazes me. Uh, I've read all this stuff before, but I keep seeing new stuff that I hadn't seen before. It's like this, mm-hmm. is, and I'll, it's it's not like you know. Every Monday we read that book. Every Monday, without fail, at a meeting we read mm-hmm. that. Book. Reach up and I've read all that stuff. I've heard all the stuff. I've heard all the jokes about it. But all of a sudden, when I start to read it and work it, work it, I start to see other stuff, and I start to start to start to understand a little bit more of of, uh, of what's going on with me. Yeah. You know, uh, Steve, can you give an example of how for people who who don't have who aren't in program, who maybe who aren't drunks like us, but um, can you give an example of how? those steps help you in a crisis in life how how okay let me let me just let me just start at the very very beginning here Mm -hmm. when you or when we started Mm -hmm. right you hear people say i had one drink and i knew this was it this was great this was really cool right Mm -hmm. and then think about where it ended up it ended up in that i think it says in the big book something about surrounded by quicksand mm. life just running crazy out of control jails institution you know children ch- children children all all messed up because of 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 what we did what our behaviors and stuff that we've done you know disasters parents families lost all kind of jobs lost opportunities lost houses apartments rental apartments you know Tense, <laughs> everything, <laughs> fear, Tense. scared of everything. That's where it ended up. That's where. Mm. That's, uh, other way, why the hell would you go? Why the hell would you stop drinking if it hadn't got that far? Mm-hmm. I, and then, and then you stop, and it's like, well, my brain don't want me to stop. Right? So even then, you stop drinking, and it gets a little bit better, but. You still have all the problems. You still have to do it. How, the, how do I deal with this stuff? How do I do that? You know, and you resist it, and you resist it, and then and then you say, okay, uh, I'll let me see. You can. Uh, I'll ask that guy to be a sponsor. Let me ask him. And you ask the guy to be a sponsor. 
And then he starts giving you this stuff to do. Like, you, have to think about, <laughs> you, know, you know, think about how you drank and what, uh, what you know, you, you got drunk all the time and you have to write, write about it. And then you have to write about all the stuff that's going wrong. Meanwhile, the stuff is still going wrong and you're like, it's not fixing it. Just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> and then you go from the shit at the end of drinking into the shit of getting sober. Right. Yeah. Start do a four step and you have to look at all the stuff that you've done and that they've done to you. And then, and then everybody says, well, they didn't really do anything to you. They just did what they had to do. And it's your fault with the way that you reacted to it. And you, and, and you, and, you, and in the end, if you got any, any kind of desire to be sober, you might look at it and say, you know what? There's a chance that I was the biggest fucking asshole. That <laughs> <possible thing." laughs> And then you you do all this stuff, and then you start to you only have to do some more shit. Right? You have to get, tell somebody about it, and then talk to the people. Like that. And then they start saying you got to go and make amends, and it's shit. <laughs> then you start. <laughs> then you walk out, have to walk out the people that you can't stand. And say, you know, I did this to you. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. You know, it was really bad. You know, and you can't say, but you you go oh, no, you gotta keep it. <laughs> I did that and I was wrong and I'm sorry. And um, um, is there anything I can do to make that better for you? And you put making yourself vulnerable. And, and then you start finding out that, you know, wow, that's, that's different. They're, people start treating you differently. Some people would say that you're an asshole, of course, and just walk yeah. off and have nothing to do. <laughs> Other people, most people will be, will forgive you for this stuff. You know? Uh, and uh, and and then you start saying, well, you know what? I might be tempted to do that stuff again, but I'm not going to do it. You know, I'm going to try and uh, let me get, I've got this sponsor. Now, and, uh, you know, I'm thinking about doing that same behavior that I did before. Or your sponsor say to you, you say, this is going on that. And they say, whoa, careful. You do remember what you did the last time with that. It was on that step of yours, on that poor step of yours. Then you got a resentment against somebody and then you went out and got drunk. Yeah, you got to do something different this time and not have your way. And then you start the difficulty of doing stuff that's against what your instincts are. Contrary action. But come on, Steve, don't tell me that you behave perfectly all the time. Oh, not at all. I'm okay. not saying because I'm st I can still be an asshole. <laughs> this, is, this is not about this is not about how well we do stuff. Progress, not perfection. It's about yeah, how yeah. badly we do stuff and how we recover. And how we clean it up, yeah. Mm -hmm. How we recover. Mm -hmm. Talking about recovery. We're not talking yes. about cure. We're mm -hmm. talking about recovery. Absolutely. And, and I what I what I what 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 I find what I found is is that from the shit that you ended up with drinking mm -hmm. and the shit that you had to go through, as good as that first drink was, is what your life gets to on the other end of the shit of getting sober. As good as that first drink was. Mm -hmm. And you wanted more of that. Now, your life, after going through the steps and doing the steps, you want these steps. You want to live in these steps. And you think, well, I was so crazy before. I don't know how crazy I am now. And then you start <laughs> going through the steps again. And then you start to enjoy it these things that you find out about yourself. And your sobriety gets better. And your life gets better. Mm -hmm. And you get more and more of that towards that first drink when it was really good in the beginning you didn't have a drink in the beginning and keep drinking because it was bad you had a drink in the beginning, <laughs> you had a drink in the beginning and he said this is it i have arrived i found nirvana yes <laughs> right well that's what you get when you go through the steps you get to get work your way back to how you felt when you had that first drink which was pretty dang good so, Steve, you you've been successful when you were using and you've been successful in your sobriety. Do you think that you're a different artist, a different drummer as a sober? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a different I'm a different drummer. I'm a different drummer because because I've I've matured as a, as a musician. Mm -hmm. I never used to. Uh, uh, well, I can't say I never did it, but I did do it a couple of times. That I didn't like it. I didn't like getting drunk and 
playing those. Playing. Mm-hmm. I didn't like it. So if I went if I went to the China Club or Spodies and somebody said, hey, come on, play. And I've been drinking. It was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, playing, I'm playing the drums tonight. I'm drinking. Huh? Uh, this is my drinking night. You go play. And then if I got to, if I went to went to one of those one of those clubs and uh, and and it was early enough and I hadn't drunk and somebody said, "Hey Steve, come play," and I go and play, I'd have a ball playing. I'd love playing. I said, "Man, that, that was that was so much fun playing." Then I get drunk. And then after that, I wouldn't play. Again. So I got him. I love doing that. And I'm- uh, speaking of those days, all right, I just have to tell you a couple of people have stepped in. So Tony said AJ was the actor bartender. I forgot about AJ from the China right. Club. AJ, that's and right. uh, Steve Postel is here and s- sending you lots of love. Ah, <laughs> hi, Steve. We, we both known Steve for a gazillion years back from back in those that's days. Right. AJ, AJ, AJ is still sober. Fantastic. <laughs> How fantastic is that? Yeah. Um, so, and do you think... Okay, so you're a better artist because you've matured as a drummer. At, yeah. Did I, you did you ever did you ever fuck up a gig because you were drunk? Did it ever get in your way? Well, I it, 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 I remember once I <laughs> I got I got completely schnackered playing, <laughs> average, playing with average white band up in up in Lake Tahoe. And, uh, and and it was I, I could barely sit on the drums. I had the <laughs> I was so smashed, and I hated it. It was just mm-hmm. everything went wrong. Everything just went. It was awful. It was terrible playing. It was just awful. And, and I, I just I never did that. I never did that again. That was the end of that. Then no fun. No fun in playing. Drums. Have you been a power of example to your kids? Are your kids okay in that regard? Kids, my kids, uh, you know, the, I, 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 the one step I did out of order, like way out of order, when I looked up at those steps, I thought, oh god, I gotta, I put my kids through like a whole bunch of stuff. You know, they were in France with their mom, and they weren't near me, and I knew they were upset that they couldn't be with me all the time. I did what I could. Um, um, I, I bought them a fax machine. And used to fax them, but uh. I go visit them in France and I was going to Europe a lot. But um, um, I, I went there and, and we went up onto Mont Blanc and I told them what I did. And and, and I told them that I was, wasn't going to do that anymore. And they were, they were shocked. <laughs> they, were, they were only little. You know? They were just shocked. And, and, and I think my son was like 11. <laughs> Becky was eight, nine. Nine years old, but I bet they forgave you. Oh, absolutely! And 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 uh, you know, my son uh, over the years has come with me to meetings, and uh, and he, he thinks that we're funny in the meeting. <laughs> he thinks we're funny. He, <laughs> he, there's so many people that he he, he grew to love um, in that meet in those meetings, and and um, Becky too. My daughter as well, uh, um, and uh, you know, they they just. I think the only time I know about my son getting drunk was on his tr- drunk was on his twenty first birthday party. He went to Vegas and got drunk. My daughter, my daughter, my daughter thought that she had the wool pulled over my eyes at one point until I turned around and told her what she was doing, and she was like, "How did you know?" And I'm like, "Well, because you know." I made you, and I know. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I, I've been blessed with that. My my children, the, the addiction hasn't gone, and 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 they've also asked that I talk to my grandchildren about it. And so that's a, a wonderful opportunity for me to um, to to um, to share my experience with them and tell them what they need to be careful of in their in their lives. How beautiful what's it means. is that? How beautiful is that? It, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, especially today. I mean, the difference that there is today. I mean, you know, back in back in back in my day, I could I could go try something. Let me try some acid. Nothing. I, I might get a bad trip. That'd probably be the worst thing that would possibly could possibly have. Yeah. Yeah. 
The, um, Mark Hochlerin, an old friend of mine, says that he opened for you with Average White Band um, in December of 1980 at Club Rockaway, and you guys were so gracious to him. That. Okay, so he, he's a drummer, and he said he was 21 at the time, and two years later, his bottom on an ultimatum from those closest to him, he met Eric in the Twin Cities, and um, that night he joined, and because if Eric could do it, he could do it, and... Yeah. Um, you know, you never know who you who you're impacting. Um, you don't. You don't. I mean, I, I've worked I've worked with guys, and uh, and and um, it just I I've been working with them in the studio, and I go go do my job, and uh, and uh, six months later, uh, I get a phone call from somebody, and they, hey, you, you still going to those meetings that you went to in the morning? Yeah, yeah. Can you take me? I got, I got a little problem. You know, I'm sure you've eskimoed your share. Yeah, it's it's and it's nice. I mean, I don't e I don't even I they, they, I don't even sponsor them. There's a couple of guys that had done that, and they I don't even sponsor them, and they found a sponsor that worked for them, and then, you know, get a couple of years on Zoom. In fact, yeah. You know? So speaking of Zoom and and this whole thing, when last we spoke, you were about to go to Japan, you were doing all, you had all these gig, all this work lined up. The pandemic hits, how, how, what has your life been like for the last, almost, it's almost it's three years, pretty Steve. Cool. <laughs> it's been pretty cool. Okay, so tell tell us, tell tell us what you've been doing. Uh, I, I grew to love my backyard. <laughs> nice. I got to hang out with my, I got to hang out with my dog. I got to hang out a bit more with, with Julia, my fiance now, and and uh, we got to, to. Did I know you guys were engaged when I saw you on Thanksgiving? Did yeah, I know that? Engaged for two years now. Oh God! Okay, I guess I. Well, I got. Well, congratulations. Well, we, had a, we have a we have a long engagement because there's we're doing things in a sober way. There's things. Where, a we're building a nest. That's wonderful. And B we're trying to make sure that all the all the junk that was got the the building debris that we had in our lives is is cleaned up before we go jumping into into getting married and and and, we, and we're doing the best we can with that so uh and that's all going along very nicely too so unpacking all those bags rather than taking the baggage with you huh when you guys get married when you get married you're engaged, when you get married when we're ready to that's what that's, it. We're, that's we're, a good we're, answer now we're okay with everything the way that it just is right now but uh uh, uh there's certain things that we have to do uh, I have to do for her security and, and for my security and and, uh, and for the, you know, everybody's security. You don't know, just go jumping in there. That's what you do when you get drunk, right? So <laughs> jumping, in, jumping in and marrying someone and they're, oh, everything's great. And then you find it, oh, oh, I didn't realize that that was coming with it. You know, we we, we both know what, what we're getting into and, uh, and we're going to clean it up as best we can. That's a beautiful thing. So, okay. So what, what have you been doing in terms of work for the last few years? Have you worked? Well, have you been first, working? The first thing, the first thing I did when I, when I, uh, when I was in New York, when the shutdown happened. Oh. And I walked across Times Square at seven o'clock in the morning to go to a meeting. And there was three people in Times Square and I was one of them. Wow. I looked at this and I said, this is not good. This is going to last for a while. So I got on a plane, flew back to, flew back to Los Angeles. And the first thing I did was call, uh, a guy that does all my all my studio stuff here, mm -hmm. and I said, "What would it take to make my studio so possible that somebody can record me remotely? An engineer can set me up and record me remotely." And he said, uh, "That was very smart thinking. You you knew it was going to last a while, huh?" And he said, ten He said it'd be ten 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 to twelve thousand dollars, and I had the money, so I I I, I, I upgraded my studio. And then uh, it came over and we set everything up. And uh, uh, Eric Thorn, Eric Thorngren, another old friend of mine from New York, he, he 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 came over and he set up all the all that we set up all the microphones and he, he they showed me how to how to work all this stuff and turn it on and all I had to do really is turn it on and if they needed a, 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 a if Eric needed a, an adjustment level he'd tell me what where to go so I mm -hmm. screen and. And then he showed me to turn it to this and then go and hit thing. And we got the room set up that he could record me remotely. So that's what we were doing. We were recording remotely for all the, all the time. 
and uh, it's been wonderful. It's been and great. have you been have you been out there? And how how back to living are you, or not? Uh, I, I, I'm, I, yeah, I, I've been, I go, I go, I'm a sort of a weekend warrior. I did a bit of a tour with John Mayer and, uh, and, and, uh, and then I did, uh, 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 uh sort of weekend warrior stuff with, with a, a band called Generation Radio, which is, um, uh, Jason Chef and, and, uh, Jay DeMarco, Jason Chef from Chicago and Jay DeMarco from, from, uh, Rascal Flats. And uh, and I've been doing that, and I did a, a New Year's uh, show with Neil Sean uh, from Journey. Uh, 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 sorry, a Christmas light and tree lighting thing. We did that at Christmas. I haven't travelled internationally um, yet, uh, but uh, 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 I'm going to go see my son in New Zealand in February, hopefully. And um, have you gotten and- COVID, Steve? I had COVID. I had COVID when I was on the road with John Mayer. Yeah, second night at Madison Square Garden. Oh, almost. Oh, had a bit, late the first night had a bit of a cough. Uh, went there the next day, and they said, "I said I got a bit of a cough, and they said, stay away from me." And, and then the COVID, the, the COVID, COVID Nazi said, "Well, we got to test you." <laughs> and they they tested me, and they said, "You're positive." And I'm like, what? I said, what, you, what, what, what am I going to do? I get on side of the stage and play. And they said, no, you got to go home. Uh, Did they have somebody to step right in for you? Actually, Questlove was coming to see me play. <laughs> so Questlove came and sat in. Wow. Couldn't, wow. Have anybody back. couldn't, get, anybody, couldn't get anybody rubbish to come. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's crazy. And how, so how was the COVID for you? Did Was it not terrible? Was it awful? It wasn't that bad. I mean, I was vaccinated, fully vaccinated. Um, uh, uh, the second, so I got it that, that night. And then the next day, I was still coughing a bit. Wasn't feeling that great. And then the, the, that, so it was two days of coughing. And then that night I went to bed. I woke up the next day and it was like somebody had poured a bucket of water on me. It was, the bed was soaking wet. I'd sweat it out. Zero symptoms, but I tested so uh, tested positive for another eight days. Did they so make was, you sit it out? I had to spend eight days in the, in the Four Seasons Hotel. You poor thing. It's a rough life. <laughs> well, Questlove couldn't have been there every night. So what? What did they? What did they do after that? They uh, 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 they they uh, they got like different guys that have played with John to come and sit in here and there and there. and then and then John caught caught COVID. Oh, ugh. and a couple of other guys in the band called COVID. So they everybody went home. Mm-hmm. They put a pause in the middle of it. You know, it seems to me like it's a, it, 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 you know if you uh, doing the weekend warrior thing is it, that's okay. I mean, I sort of take care of myself as I go out. Um, you know, uh, being out probably a bit more aware over a short period of time. Maybe you just drop your guard a little bit when you're out there for an extended period of time. Seems to when, me, when was it that you got sick? I think it would be like February of February. So of it was when the whole Omicron thing was going crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so since then, you've you've traveled since you've done the weekend warrior thing, and you've gone out and yeah, nothing. I've been good. And are you careful when you travel? Yes. Do you still mask? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm seventy two years old. You know, let's get real here. You know, <laughs> my 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 mother died of chest problems. Uh, I, if I if I get a regular cold. It goes straight to my chest, and I get, mm-hmm. sometimes I get asthmatic bronchitis. I don't like that feeling of not being. <clears throat> I don't like that. I'm not a sickly person, so it doesn't happen that often. That good, thank God. But um, um, I, don't, I, 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 I'm not going to be look out there looking for it at all. Uh, it just seems to me. I was telling you before, my my daughter, my daughter-in-law. Got it, and then had a heart attack. Um, oh, God, poor thing. She's Thirty-eight years old. Nothing wrong with the heart. It was a virus that attacked the heart. So, um, 
Is she okay now? How's she doing now? She's great now. She's fine, but she can't travel for three to six months. She can't travel. Mm-hmm. She's got fluid around her heart. Ay, ay, ay. I don't want that either. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, don't want any of that stuff. And there's a new variant, some 11 dot, I don't know what the hell it is, some new thing to... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, I mean, I... I, I, when I when I go move through an airport because there's so many people around you, I, I wear an N95, and when I get onto a plane, I wear an RN95. And, and What's an RN95? I know KN95. Sorry, KN95. Okay, okay, yeah. KN95, mm-hmm. and it fits a little closer. But I have it, when I when I get up and start walking, it sort of restricts my breathing. So I have to breathe through that thing. So I put on the N95, and I, and I can breathe better through that when I move through the airport. Once I'm outside the airport, I'll take it off. But, but, um, yeah. Okay, well, before, we can't leave on this note, this COVID note. Let's let's talk some fun stuff before we go. So so you're playing with Clapton. It's you, it, it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and uh and and you get you get to play you play with George Harrison next. How do you go from Clapton to Harrison? How did that happen? Well, George used to come and hang out with us when we played at the Royal Albert Hall. I knew he used to like come down and hang out with with Eric, and he was in the dressing room one night, and he said to Eric, uh, "I got I've been offered this this tour in Japan." And Eric said, "Where well, you should go?" And he said, "Well, I would, but I haven't got a band." And he said, "Well, I'm not doing anything. Why don't you take my band?" Wow. But George turned around and said, "Would you guys come with me? Would you guys come with me to Japan?" He said, Are you "Fucking kidding, of course we would." <laughs> Great. So, so wait, before you get off on George, what what kind of band leader boss was Eric? Was Eric a taskmaster? Was he easy? Was he challenging? Was he ex- what what was he like to play for, play with? Yeah, he said, I'm Eric Clapton. I gotta play like Eric Clapton every night. Make me play. That's it. All we had to do is give him some excitement, give him something to play. Most times you walk out there, you start playing, and we just have to cruise underneath, have fun playing with him. Yeah. Other wow. times you walk out there, you start looking for something and everything. You'd have to throw in some stuff to just kick him into kick him in the gear. You know? And how about George? What what was it? you played with fucking George Harrison? What was that like? He was an amazing fella. He really was an amazing fella. And I, I mean, and a great songwriter, and just mm. just a really sweet, sweet, sweet man. He, he, it was funny. We, we, this is, this is George. We, 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 we were, um, we were rehearsing, right? and, um, and, um, he said, uh, uh, okay, um, let's do, uh, what's that, what's that song? Uh, uh, uh oh, I forget the name of the song now. Did you hear come the song? I have to think of the solo. I have to think. Oh, I can't even think of the solo now. Anyways, one of these Beatles songs, and uh, we we play the song, and 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 he and he says, uh, he says, oh, he said, that was that was pretty good. And I said, yeah, it would have been really good if you'd played the solo, right? <laughs> and he said, I played a solo. I said, I know you played a solo, but you didn't play the solo. And he said. What are you talking about, these solos? Uh, and it, he, uh, 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 was it? Uh, uh, something, something, something. It, it, that solo is so iconic. I, I started to sing the solo to him, and then the whole band started to sing the guitar solo, and so. so <laughs> He, did, he had no idea that that solo was so important. It, really? It, that if you if you sit and listen to something and somebody plays another solo that's other than that, it just doesn't sound right. It's like, it's like where, where's, where's the solo? <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you play the solo? Yeah. And so we had to, the whole band had to teach him. It. <laughs> <laughs> that's hysterical. He learned it and he did it and he and he, he loved doing it. He was a, he was a, he was a wonderful, lovely fellow. 
Video. That's hysterical. Okay, so then uh, I'm racing through. I mean, you played with so many people. The list goes on and on, but important, ki- iconic. How did you connect with with um, Tom, and how did that gig happen? Well, that was kind of through George Harrison because uh, we played another show after we did this tour. Mm-hmm. We did a, a show at the Royal Albert Hall. Wow. And Eric, Eric wasn't available to do that to do that um, to do that gig. So George called uh, uh, Mike Campbell, and Mike Campbell showed up. And I didn't know who Mike Campbell was. Uh, I, I had no idea who he was. And we sit down, we start to play, do a couple of rehearsals and everything. And I'm sitting there with Royal Lee, and I'm like, dang, that, that guy Mike Campbell can play. He's really good. <laughs> you know, he's like, he just had this way. He could, he could fit right in, like, sound-wise and everything. He, he was... He, he, it, what he would play was great, but it wouldn't sort of be, it wouldn't be like sort of here I am, Mike Campbell, you know? Right, right. It, it would just fit in just perfectly. He was just had a way of playing in there. And, and then if George went to him solo, Mike would stand up there and play this incredible solo. You know? And I'm like, who is this guy? And I'm like, well, he says, plays, plays with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And then a couple of years pass and, 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 and um, I get this phone call in New York from Registry. You remember Registry? Radio Registry calls me up and they said, there's a session out in Los Angeles next week. Can you go out there and do that? And I said, yes, I can I can go out there and do that. Who's that for? It's top secret. <laughs> what do you mean top secret? Who is it? Who I play? Can't tell you. They can't tell you. I said, okay. Triple scale. <laughs> <laughs> Did I? Magic words. Yeah. So I go out there and and they put me in in the um, what's that hotel uh, Chateau Marmont? No, no, not even the the one on Ventura Boulevard. Oh, the, the Sportsman's Lodge or something? They put me in the Sportsman's Lodge, which is not still not telling me who the, who the hell is this for? Who, who, who is this for? Right? And uh, and 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 it's out here at Sound City. I had to get go out to Sound City, so. Get up in the morning, drive out there to Sound City, and I see Kenny Arnos' drum kit coming out. My my drums are already in there, being set up. I wander in the control room. And say, Who's this for? I walk in there. There's Mike Campbell and Tom Petty sitting there. The start of twenty five years. <laughs> wow. Was it, it was it instant love with you and Tom? Like, what was your relationship like at the very beginning? Well, I mean, I, I, I didn't know. I, I did. I, I'd met Mike before. Mm-hmm. He's a nice guy, a really nice guy. And uh, and and uh, Tom seemed very nice. That we sat down and started work on on. Um, I don't know how it feels. That was the first song that we played, which is not a bad start. <laughs> I was I was listening to Heartbreakers today. It, it played for three hours. It was. A hit every every song was a hit a new one a new one a new one amazing, song, amazing songwriter mm. but he, he he so we 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 got this you worked on the song a little bit and then got, and then we did a take and we did this take and then we went back into the control room to listen to it and tom was sitting in the front and i was standing behind the board next to my right back to the room like this and uh, they listened to the to the track through, and then Mike and Thomas sort of leaning over and listening, and then he stood up and he looked at Mike and and Rick Rubin, and he said, uh, "Wow, what a difference a drummer makes, huh?" <laughs> wow. and, I'm, and I'm like, "Well, what does that mean?" <laughs> <laughs> that, that, could, that could mean anything. <laughs> Right, they're gonna be, well, no, it sounds pretty good to guy me. Who was in here before back because this one sucks. <laughs> and then uh, Tom looked at me and he said, "Don't worry, you won." <laughs> and that was, and that was it. And we started, kept working. What, what, and what, what, what was your personal relationship with him like? Because that's a lot of years to be together. Uh, I, I, I'd say that we were friends. Uh, that we were friends and um, uh, and we I think the whole band had a really special relationship with music 
that, that we all um, we were all on the same page when it came to making music and doing the best that we could to make this sound like a great band. And Was it challenging for you as a sober man to? I wasn't sober. I wasn't sober the first when I first when I first started working with Tom. I was still drinking. And you then still when I came back out the second time, I'd stopped. And uh, and uh, uh, the only person... Did that change was... the dynamic at all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never thought. The only person that noticed was the other guy in the band that was in the program. <laughs> yeah, he said, have you stopped drinking? And I said, well, yeah, I stopped a few months back. Oh. Huh. You know, I, I, I don't drink either. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I had company. On, on Thanksgiving, I remember Julia saying to me that she knew the real reason that Tom had passed and that it wasn't because of the drugs, it, it, that it was about his hip. Wasn't it about his hip? Yeah, he, he, had, a, he, had, a cracked, he had a cracked hip. And... Uh, 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 and he was going to have a surgery on it. He was going to have a surgery, and it broke. Basically, his hip just popped, and it was agony. And uh, he took some fentanyl. He got some fentanyl for somewhere. No, we got that one. But he took mm. killed him. It's tragic. Wish he was here today. He was amazing, mm. amazing, an amazing man. Amazing, uh, um, incredible talent, so lovely. An amazing artist, amazing. He 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 was he was very um, insightful. He was smart. He was very smart, mm. very smart. And uh, uh, and um, yeah, uh, 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 the whole band. We all loved him. We all loved him very much. We love each. We love each other. We we still do love each other. You know. You've family. had the most extraordinary family, more, family, more family than workmates, I would say. Hmm. Do, do, are you still? You you are still close. I'm sorry. You're still close. Yeah. 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 You've also had it's, some incredible one-offs in your car. Huh? We, ne we never, we never, the heartbreakers had this thing is like we never really sort of like all over each other all the time, but we're always there for each other, you know. Mm. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really great relationship that we have. I think it's a really nice relationship that we have. That's lovely. It's, that's a lot of time. A lot of people don't spend that, that, that many years with their own family, with their blood family. So, well, it's been 30 years now that, that I mean, I've still. I'm still a disc jockey. This is my disc jockey microphone. I do my radio show on. Your your um serious yeah heartbreaker show. New guy, my new guy show. And uh, and uh, I, uh, so it's been thirty years now. It's thirty years in October uh, that I that I started my association with the heartbreakers. Yeah. Is there anybody that you listen to now, Steve? Is where you go? Oh, I'd love to play with that one. Is there anybody that turns you on like that now? I always wanted to play with Flea for some reason. Uh, 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 I like the way that he plays, uh, and uh, uh, he's got a really nice take on playing. His I never got to play with him yet. You know, that would be nice to do. I like to play with him. Well, I would think that anything you want to do, you could make happen. I I so appreciate this, Steve. I um. Thank you for getting so real and uh, talking about things that are really important and um i i value you not only as an artist but as a a man and a sober man and a human being and um i'm very grateful to um, know I, you i have to say i value, I, I, I always like to, to have a, a, a be able to to talk you know i, mean, I know they say press radio films they don't say anything about the internet <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh it it, it <laughs> It, it's amazing how many people out there are in pain of some some description or other, and you never know when you know. I'm I'm quite open about 
being a sober man and not drinking and not using. I don't always, I don't always talk about AA. I don't always talk about. Uh, I, sometimes I just uh, say, you know, if, if you got a, if you, if you, if you, if you need help, it's in the beginning of the phone book. Just exactly out, out of the beginning of the phone book. But uh, 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 um, uh, uh, I, I'm not Mister AA. Uh, I, I, I attend AA meetings on a daily basis. You know, I have a, a very healthy respect for the disease that I have. It's way, way more powerful than I am. And uh, and I have to, I need the help of a, a bunch of, a bunch of alcoholics. <laughs> bunch of sober drunks, nothing like a sober drunk. To, to, to stay mm -hmm. where I am, you know, to stay in this place. I like it here. I like it much better here than in that place that was terrifying. 29 years ago or 30 years ago yeah. well thank you so much for for the music and for the humanity and for your service and um we have to go for for coffee lunch soon we're neighbors now maybe we go for round three in a couple of years i would love that but before that we'll with we'll snuffy will and julia will go we'll go we'll go eat some food and that sounds good and not me. drink alcohol <laughs> um, have a happy and healthy new year and uh much love to you and julia thank you so much steve thank you thank you ricky